Hi, everyone. My name is Itamar Haim. I run the engineering groups for virtualization, system, and container management in Red Hat. And I'm Fabian Deutsch, and I work on virtualization, too. And we're going to talk about KubeVirt, a project we started to look at what can we do about virtual machines and containers. So I actually come from uh, Kubernetes, the startup that created KVM, later acquired by Red Hat. And there were a lot of cool things about KVM. What one of the cool things, coolest things about it was that it made virtual machines just another user process on Linux. Running just a single virtual machine you know, was very cool that we could do it on Linux, but in order to solve customer problems, real use cases, we need to look at clustered environments, right? So shared storage, shared networking, Managing the full life cycle. This is where overt Red Hat virtualization came from for the virtual enterprise virtualization use case. Evolution later on, the cloud use case, OpenStack uh, solving that problem. Infrastructure as a service, still running mostly virtual machines, also now looking at different workloads like containers, trying to virtualize not just the virtual machines, but also network storage abstraction, other layers more consuming through APIs as well. And then Kubernetes came along. Well, containers came along and Kubernetes. And the nice thing about Kubernetes is that it tries to do something similar, but for a more generic use case for us, right? It's not focused on virtual machines, rather on any process. So orchestration of processes on a shared cluster, same problem, right? Cluster, how do I access storage? How do I virtualize network? How do I do load balancing? all the operations around that. So all similar concepts. Now, if virtual machines are just user processes, and they already, by the way, use some of the same isolation level technologies like SLinux, like uh, C groups, so they don't do namespaces, but they do use some of the other similar isolation technologies, and Kubernetes can do this for any user process, can we just handle both of them on a single environment? <coughs> with Kubernetes. Now, why would we want to do this? So yes, containers are the new cool thing. They're not that new, but like adoption, let's call it, right, is new. And everyone wants to do the new things with containers, but it's going to take time, okay? Not everything is going to worth the ROI to convert to containers. You know, a lot of enterprises still have mainframes, right? that have been dying every decade uh, for the past two. So it's going to take a while. Foreseeable future, we can expect virtual machines are going to stay on-premise. Yeah, public cloud is a lot relevant for a lot of workloads. On-premise, going to stay. Now, if you think five, 10 years ahead, would you want to run multiple environments side by side, different technologies, or would there be benefit to converge to a single infrastructure that can run the different workloads using similar tools, similar processes, benefiting you know, from that efficiency leading to cost reduction in the end. It's also nice as you will be migrating workloads from virtual machines. So new workloads, let's say you're writing them with containers. Existing workloads, you're hoping you're going to be able to move them to containers. As you do that, it's easier, it's going to be easier if it's going to run on the same infrastructure. So if I have a bunch of virtual machines running in a cluster of hosts and I convert the application, maybe I don't start with the database, but with the, you know, uh, uh, with the front end and the back end logic, if I can keep the affinity running on the same infrastructure, on the same host, on the same cluster, and not an entirely different infrastructure, it's going to be more efficient. I don't need to think about when do I move you know, the servers from this side to that side. I don't need to over-provision my servers. And I can get benefit from same network, same affinity, same storage, things like that. Another nice thing is that some of the Kubernetes <laughs> concepts, some of them exist, uh, you know, scheduling is uh, pretty advanced in virtualization and OpenStack world. Uh, but some of the concepts, if we can just make the virtual machine just another pod, are very nice. So, oh, daemon set. There are a lot of use cases we do that for virtualization today. Kubernetes, again, is very nice, and it simplifies 
this for the generic use case and virtual machines become relevant. The benefit to Kubernetes is there's a lot of experience in the virtualization space, okay, handling. Kubernetes is very nice and easy for the cloud use case because it has advanced features that it can leverage from the cloud. It is, well, less mature on the on-premise and bare metal use cases, and the virtualization experience brings those benefits to Kubernetes. Now, there are different use cases for running virtual machines on Kubernetes. One of them is I want better isolation. I want to run a container, but I want to run it in a virtual machine. For better isolation, I believe that a virtual machine you know, has smaller surface uh, of attack, things like that. I know how to run to protect VMs. I want to run my container workload in a VM. I want to run CI, ephemeral VMs, things like that. That's not the use case we're focusing on. That's the container use case, you know, with the nuance on the technology being run. That's not why we're not focusing on, the, on that. It's an interesting use case. It's not going to lead to convergence. You won't see you know, enterprise virtualization customer, VMware customer going to that use case. So we're focusing on for the convergence is can we solve the full-fledged VM use case? Now, in virtualization, you know, a bit more mature in space, in management system, life cycle, et cetera. Kubernetes, again, very promising, moving really fast, still has some gaps compared to uh, the years of uh, things being done in virtualization. Similar concept, you know, managing clusters, storage networks, things like that, and a slew of features that exist uh, in virtualization. Not going to go for all of them or all the gaps, just example. And as we enumerate them, we see that some of them are gen very generic and relevant to Kubernetes and to containers, and some of them are specific to virtualization, but hey, not so bad, we can make them fit easily. So things like shared memory. So if I run multiple virtual machines, similar workload, similar operating system, I can use what's called KSM, a sibling of KVM, looking at how can I do shared memory for my virtual machines. That is relevant for containers running similar workloads on the same host. I can converge those uh, memory pages. Memory ballooning, more specific to virtual machines, less relevant for containers. We're looking at schedulers. So Kubernetes is a pluggable, pluggable scheduler. Uh, and in virtualization space, similar concepts. Do I want to schedule for performance across my host, load balance as much as possible? Or maybe I want to converge and save on Power, power saving policies, so converge as much as possible overnight, and you know, then again, spin out in the morning so I can shut down some of my servers. Uh, so Kubernetes has pluggable schedules. It doesn't have the already existing, let's say, 80 different scheduling policies that exist in OpenStack. So there are gaps to close in that area. Another aspect is HR reservations. So a lot of the focus in Virtualization is around how do I handle failures, okay? Why? Because I didn't write my code in 2017 to scale out and handle, you know, uh, replication controllers spanning for availability, but it's running on a single machine, and if that fails, or the host it runs on fails, I want to make sure I can run it again. So I, want to, I won't run a workload, HR reservations, if there won't be enough capacity in case a host fails to run the critical VMs on it on another host. When we're talking about protecting, we get to fencing. Okay? Fencing is, I think that node failed, can I run my VM on another machine? Similar if I'm running containers. If I'm running uh, a pet or a stateful container, I want to make sure I don't run it again. So for virtual machines, because I will corrupt my shared storage, would be my file system or my database. Uh, for containers, if I'm running a Postgres uh, container, a Postgres pod, if the node failed, if I run it again without making sure that node is down, I'm going to corrupt my database. So similar concept, but you know, what, when we look at this at gaps, so okay, I don't see the node, can I make sure it's down? Fencing it is going to kill all the workloads on it, so let's make sure. Maybe not just rely on the network path, 
that node is using shared storage. It keeps some lease on that storage. Maybe use, check it with another node if that storage lease is still active before fencing it. So maybe just my networking is down. Uh, is it me or, you know, is it you or is it me? Okay. If I don't see one node, I should fence it. If I don't see 50% of the node, maybe it's me. I shouldn't, you know, kill the rest of the cluster. Going to defining those power management uh, fencing devices, again, there are a lot, lots of lots of requirement and experience there of, okay, first thing you want to do is try the fencing device on the physical host, IPMI, ILO, et cetera. It's going to create a nice shutdown process. So that's your first priority device, but you define multiple. If that didn't work, you know, maybe you try with SSH, then with IPMI, that didn't work, you can actually go and turn off the power okay, the, uh, to that uh, server. It probably has two sockets, so you need to do, you know, first priority is IPMI. If not, then the second priority is two different fencing devices together. Uh, and before you fence the device, maybe it's dumping, and if it's, you know, a host with a terabyte or two terabyte of RAM, it could take a while for the dump to happen. Uh, and if you care about this dump, then you want to not fence the host until it finished k-dumping. So you want to check something before you're doing the fencing. So again, a lot of things not directly related to how do I schedule my workloads, rather how do I handle failures, how do I handle host lifecycle, network configuration, so very cool, you know, virtual networking, VXLAN, all of those in the cloud and uh, Kubernetes space, but when you look at virtual machines, and again, we look at those because we care about if we want to make this converge, we need to preserve the behavior, lower the barrier of entry for anyone running virtual machine and expecting this to behave. They need to change to the new world, okay? It's a huge change in training, behavior, uh, in what they need to do if we can make it as similar as possible to move to a newer technology but preserve concepts, then you know, easier barrier to move. And in this case, if their virtual machines are running using you know, layer two VLANs uh, and they really care about, again, robustness, so they care about how did we bond the physical interfaces on the host, again, not related to how do I orchestrate my workloads, but how do I make sure my environment is ready? And then we get to the VM definition, lots of parameters there, some of them relevant, some of them, uh, do I remote my audio, video, not relevant. Um, hopefully live migration is going to be relevant for containers. Then it's like policies and nuances around live migration. How do I do CPU pinning, NUMA pinning, thing like, things like that. So a lot of different gaps in, uh, you know, that between comparing what we have, which is obviously, you know, uh, a lot of years and really mature to a very promising technology with a lot of cool things in it. Some of those gaps nicely generic, some of them more specific to virtualization. You know, can we close them? Thanks. So, uh, Itamat talked a lot about why we want to do that and how VMs look and what we need to express if we want to run them on Kubernetes. So, and that's what we did. We looked, um, when we started to look into this, we started with a research. So we looked what, what did exist at that time. So I'm starting at the bottom of the slide. So we looked at virtlet, hyper and clear containers were not there yet, but we were keeping them inside over time. By looking what we required, um, so, so we were learning about Kubernetes, and then we start to see, okay, how, how do we express what we need? How do we express that in Kubernetes? And the question was, can we express that in a pod specification, for example, in the API of a pod? Or do we require a specific entity to express all the details we require for our fully-fledged VMs? Um, that was actually a question which is also differentiating the existing approaches which are somehow related to VMs, so the Vertlet or, or Hyper or Clear Containers, because some of them are using VMs transparently to the user, so you can't really address specific details of the VMs. And in other approaches, like in the Wordlet, Wordlet, you have to some degree the control over how the real running VM is looking. Um, so that is what we were looking at. And then we were looking, okay, but if we now get to running the VM, how should that be looking? There are several ways of how to do it. So CRI was just emerging at that point in time, like half a year or a year back. 
So we looked, does, no, it was actually before the CRI time, so we looked, does it make sense to, to implement a different runtime inside the kubelet to run VMs? And can we somehow pass all the necessary parameters to that runtime? Does that work? But we also looked at another approach where we basically said um, we don't want to run the VM by the, by the kubelet because the kubelet doesn't provide us all the necessary functionality. For example, when it comes to NUMA pinning um, or uh, guarantees about, I don't know, accessing a host agent inside the VM. So because of that reason, we started to look, OK, can, does it make sense to run the VM inside a contained environment? So for example, in a daemon set on the hosts and, and run the VM there because then we've got the full control over our specific runtime without the constraints of going through that CRI channel. In the end, um, we saw that the existing approaches focused, and I laid out a few, is that the vertlet focused a bit on the pod API and how to run VMs there. Um, Hyper also used VMs for transparent isolation and like clear containers, so we didn't have direct access to the VMs. And because those approaches were using or looking into the transparent approach or more transparent, we looked, okay, let us try to create a specific API for a VM to express all our needs. As Idema said, we, came, we come from the background of really knowing what we will need in that VM specification. And we know it's going to be a lot of details. So that's why we decided to go with a specific VM API for now. And all of those approaches um, are also looking at doing the runtime as, as a container runtime or an implementation of the container runtime interface or, or similar. And we went to, to gain experience. We, for now, we choose the path to, to use the VM runtime to, to deliver the VM runtime inside a pod on the host to really spawn the VMs. And that has some nice side effects, which we'll get to in a moment. So, to start with the API, I said we created our own API, and what we currently got is similar looking to what you see um, on the slide. So you get all the, it's looking, it's a regular Kubernetes object, so it's implemented using TPRs, and um, the header is looking like, like a pod specification, but then you get into the details in the domain. There you got all the, the glory and small details you, you need for a VM. I just have here a small, a small part of what you can express, but you can easily extend with adding controllers for specific PCI devices, USB devices, additional displays, I don't know, path through of USB devices from a, from a client. All of that needs to be expressed in a specification if we want to do, if we want to run VMs in their entirety, so, so completely in an enterprise environment. But, uh, yeah, so that is our uh, API. But this API is just an abstraction because some of the parts can already be handled by Kubernetes. For example, if we look um, at the top, we see there that the specification contains a node selector so that you can select where you want to run the VM in that case. But Kubernetes, so, oh yeah, so Kubernetes provides the same functionality for pods. So for us, it was easy if we were running. Um, VMs in, in pods that we could reuse that functionality from Kubernetes. And that was actually an aim of us to be able to leverage functionality which is already present in Kubernetes, starting with, with that um, node selector. Then obviously there are some details in the, in the specification which are VM specific and which don't appear or have an equivalent in Kubernetes itself, like the VM specific parts which are then passed to, uh, to Libvirt, the, um, the type of the VM and the amount of memory um, or the number of CPUs. But as an educated Kubernetes user, you do know that memory and CPUs are represented in, 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 uh, in namespaces and in the pod itself. So you can set resource requirement and resource limits in a pod. And that's actually um, what we are also using. We're using these values to, to pass them onto Kubernetes, and we will see in a moment how we do that, to, to let Kubernetes do this work for us. So to, to allow Kubernetes, the Kubernetes scheduler, to allow the Kubernetes scheduler to use these informations to make scheduling decisions for us. And that's a, the benefit here is that we can, we can indirectly or directly use the Kubernetes scheduler for scheduling by letting him know what the memory and CPU requirements of the VM are. Then, um, so that is how we already leverage Kubernetes. Um, as a la last point, Currently, we, we're also looking at how we can 
attach other objects to VMs, so how we can reuse other resources inside the cluster. And we started with using volumes because they are there today. And um, volumes are also something you often require with VMs uh, because they need a disk to run on. And so here we try to, to, consume, to, make, to enable us to consume existing volumes which are available in the cluster and share them actually with other pods if necessary. Not, not at the same time, but um, as needed. So I already said that some of the parts are being mapped to Kubernetes to allow the scheduler, for example, to have an insight of what the resource requirements of the web will be. And we do that um, by writing them into the pod specification. And to give you some background, because we didn't get to that yet, our VMs will be running in the, in the space of a pod. I use space because it's untainted. And um, so for every VM we are running, um, we create, a, we create a pod which is getting scheduled with the, um, with the resource requirements we expressed in the pod specification. And inside that pod space on the node, we are then launching a VM. Um, but in the end, and that's to highlight that we're doing research, that specification you saw is just one approach. There are also other approaches which we are looking into which might make more sense. Because that approach which I showed is specific to having really pet VMs. So you have to full control. You have the full control over how each and every VM is looking. But if we think about templating VMs, like it's more common in the, in the cloud use case, then that pattern did not work out so well. So a pattern which would work better is, for example, if we say we associated a VM template or a VM config to a pod, so whenever, because then we cannot only associate that template to a pod, but also to other objects like deployments or replication controllers and daemon sets. Because in that case, we could use those constructs, those concepts, to to get VM spawned, like those concepts would be used inside of Kubernetes. For example, if we take a replication controller with a count of five. Um, and it references VMs, then we would expect that the replication controller or an associated component is spawning those five instances of VMs. Um, and in the end, yet another way of how to express um, how a VM could be running is even a more simplistic approach, which we thought is much closer to what Kubernetes would, would expect, how, how running VMs would look like. Um, that's shown on the right side of the slide. That's really a minimalistic approach but which would be more suited for Kubernetes eventually because it's, it's clean, it's dense, and you have sane defaults, but it did not meet our requirements of having the full control over, over the VM itself. So we are still looking what is the right approach to cover our pet VM use case and the cloud VM use case, but also to be friendly for Kubernetes because that is what we are lo also looking for. We want to align with Kubernetes. We want to make it natural in a Kubernetes environment or if you're familiar with Kubernetes, to run VMs. Okay, so we talked a lot, so let's go ahead hands-on and see uh, if that really works out. Uh, can you still? Yeah, you can. So, what I'm going to show you is now to how that basically works. We're already good on time, so um, I'll make it dense. On the right-hand side, you see that um, there are a few things running on the cluster, and we will get to them in a moment. But to show you the really important bit is that you can really um, work with VMs. So what I prepared is um, a small kubectl wrapper, um, because, and that's where we also see our contributions to Kubernetes is. For, for VMs, you need, I will get to that in a moment. I, I, don't, I don't spoil you right now. So first, let's start by creating a VM, and that's simple. Um, as creating a pod. So we just reference um, a VM specification. And here it says VM test VM was created. That's really helpful. So on the right hand side, you now see that um, we created that pod where the VM is going to be launched, that it was scheduled and is running. But we don't really see that it's happening. So what we can do now, and that is why we need the wrapper, is we can use some um, spice, which is some kind of an enhanced VNC to actually access the test VM to see that something is running. Um, so this really is a VM on the host. Um, we now wonder, OK, how do we see where is it running? And the good is we can use the native Kubernetes tools to inspect that. So we can say kubectl cluster get minus o json uh, VMs test VM. And we see down here that it's running on node 0. 
I've, uh, I've done a vagrant setup on my, on my laptop to, to illustrate that. And if we go to, the, um, to node zero, which you can see up here, then you see that the test VM is really running here. So you also see that I'm using Versh, and Versh is just the interface delivered because we said we don't need to reinvent yet another system to launch VMs, so we stuck to Libvirt for now. So the VM is still booting. Um, my laptop needs to handle all of that, so please be patient while it's booting. Um, but in the meantime, um, we can move on. So we know now that the VM is running um, on node zero, and we see that we can introspect that with, um, um, with kubectl, but also because, and now we come to the interesting part. So VMs have that, con VMs are stateful. Our pet VMs are not like the uh, transient VMs, which Itamar mentioned, but our VMs are important and we want them to run. But it happens now and then that you need to replace hardware on a host. So the really interesting bit when it comes to comparing containers to pods is, I need to migrate my VM way to, to do hardware maintenance or whatever, or scale up or repair something. And that's possible now. So because we said a VM is not a pod, but a VM is running inside a pod, the nice thing we can do is we can just say, OK, let's take that VM and move it to another space. So it's like a harbor for ships. I mean, we are in all that, in that maritime environment here in Kubernetes. So we, we have that pod now, it's current harbor, but we can now say, let's move it to another one. And we can use kubectl uh, minus f to actually get it moved to, to another place. And we've got here another manifest, which is called a mani uh, yeah, migration manifest. The event VM keeps running. Um, and if we look now at the running pods, we see that down here we've got a migration po pod. It's still there. Good. Um, which is actually performing the migration. We also see here, this is the original harbor of the VM where it's currently running. And the migration job created a second pod on another node. We will see eventually where it lands. And this migration job is also now responsible for performing the migration. Hopefully, as it is with demos, I expect this to uh, end successfully, but we need to be a little bit more patient. It takes about a minute to, to complete. In the, meantime, in the meantime, we can take a look at how does this migration job look at all, because it's created just like anything else. Um, here it's very simplistic. Um, it's just the beginning. There are many more tunables to migrations like bandwidth throttling and making selections of the destination host. And we imagine that this is going to be expected inside this migration object which we are creating on the cluster. Um, in the meantime, uh, thank you, demo, um, the migration finished and we see that um, the new pod is really be, was created, that the old one, old one got cleaned up and that the migration job has gone. Um, we can now verify that by looking at the, um, at the um, Location of the of the VM, which should now reside on a um, on a different node, and that's true. So previously it was running on node zero, now it's running on master. And to show you, it it's still boot or it, it has booted, and the display is still there, and that's really the same VM. If we now look at the master, we see that the test VM is here, and not anymore on node zero, and that's really nice. So. That's really nice, why? Because we didn't have to contradict with any Kubernetes patterns, but we could lay our virtualization specific logic on top and we are not conflicting with Kubernetes. So I need to come to an end here because we're tight on time, but because, um, uh, just a second please, uh, let me clean that up. Oh. Oh yeah, that's wrong. Oh, there you go. So, so because VMs are yet just another process, we obviously don't have um, we don't have a problem to run all type of VMs. So even here, we can say that um, if we create a second VM, um, that it doesn't matter if we, if we're booting Fedora or if it's another operating system. On this laptop, it's just an issue that it's taking so much um, resources as we're now running three VMs, and that one is also uh, running in nested mode. But let's see if it's coming up 
or not. Oh, there we go. So we can even spawn Windows, which is really nice uh, on Kubernetes, because, yeah, it's just yet another VM. And we have all the freedom to do the tuning on the low level to enable Windows to launch. So it needs all those ACPI tunables and HPET, I don't know, what so else. And by having uh, Qvert being a layer and not inside Kubernetes, we have the freedom to do all this tuning. So let me get back to the slides. Uh, I just need to... Uh, Remove the uh, VM again, otherwise um, I can't switch slides anymore. So there we go. Great. Good. Uh, so, uh, so here's the slides, and I'll put now. Um, and basically, we implemented. <laughs> so. Um, Basically, we implemented, uh, implemented the operator pattern, or one instance of the operator pattern. So we've got a daemon set, which is providing the vert lender, which is doing all the heavy lifting on the nodes. And we've got a vert controller, which is taking care of the cluster-wide logic. So in that case, whenever you create a VM, the vert controller is taking care to create an associated pod, as I described. Whenever that pod is getting scheduled, then the vert tender is taking over the heavy lifting to launch the VM inside that space of the pod. And that obviously doesn't just work for one VM per host, but also for multiple. So that was really quick, great. Um, however, there are still gaps. We don't speak just about launching VMs, but we speak about the whole management of VMs. And as Aitima said, it's ju not just about VMs itself, it's also about the scheduling, it's also about the handling error cases. And this slide just illustrates one of the main gaps we identified so far. Some of them can be solved in a layered approach and so are specific to virtualization, but some of those issues are, are generic. So we aim with Kubert at, at working with Kubernetes to improve them in that Kubernetes layer because we think they're beneficial to, to containers as well. For example, let's take storage. We see that authentication with iSCSI is currently not supported. Well, there's now a PR to support it. Um, and that's exactly this, the kind of stuff we know. We know that we require authentication for, for iSCSI connections. Um, and we know that for, for, for scheduling, we need to expose more information about our workload to let Kubernetes do the right scheduling decisions. And we want to see how can we improve Kubernetes generically so that we can use it for our specific use case. So, wrap up real quick. So, as I showed with the API, there are different ways how to implement the API and where to put the focus. And it goes and falls a little bit with the API of what use cases we address. So, what I want to say is that we're still in a bit in the flux of where we want to put our focus with the API, what uh, use cases we want to support, um, which we don't. Then, using libvirt, we have benefits of a stable API. It's well tested, we can do monitoring. It abstracts away all of the little details, which is pretty nice, but it raises some, some issues. Like, libvirt is yet, just yet another daemon on the host. And the kubelet actually expects to be the owner of all processes on that, or of all the important processes on the host. And that's also necessary to make scheduling decisions because Kubernetes needs to be aware of the resource consumptions and so on and so forth. Um, Kube is not mature enough yet. Um, so, for example, multipath, if it comes to connecting really, I don't know, fiber channel or so, Multipath setups, that is currently not handled by Kubernetes, so we want to understand, is it part of Kubernetes, what should be handled by Kubernetes, or is it expected to be just working? Um, and there are um, examples on the previous slide in other areas as well. The operator pattern worked out really well, well, so layering all our logic on top of Kubernetes instead of pushing it into Kubernetes itself. Let me see, what can I go in here? Yeah, so, one obvious problem is that with our approach of having the runtime inside a container so contained is that we don't gain real deep integration or cooperation with the kubelet. It has, there, there are several reasons for that. So first, we bypass the kubelet for, for stuff, for, for spawning a process, and so we can't use features of the kubelet for spawning a process, so the VM process. So we need to re-implement stuff. But we actually don't want to re-implement stuff, we actually want to be a friendly citizen and cooperate with Kubernetes to that, do that stuff. And we're still thinking about and talking to the Libvirt people and other people in Kube to see how can the cooperation between Kubelet and Libvirt be improved to, to avoid that we need to replicate code on, on both sides. And how to, but it's difficult because you have 
two demons having process trees and, and getting them together and, and sharing functionality is, is a challenge. Um, yeah, currently we're tuned to what toward pet VMs, which has a benefit, but it doesn't address all the use cases. Um, yeah, and um, that's also a limitation of our API that we cannot use all Kubernetes concepts for free. Okay, for summary, I hand it over to, uh, to Itamar again. Thanks, Fabian. No, last slide. Don't need to think. Uh, so, just to summarize, we, we're trying to balance you know, a lot of things here. A you know, bottom-up approach is how do we make this play as nice as possible with Kubernetes? So, if you know, Kubernetes is the foundation and we need to grow it with features, how do we make it play as nice as possible with Kubernetes? On the other hand, our top-down approach is, okay, we have the virtualization use case, the cloud use case. Okay? We know what the gaps we want to solve are. How does it look if we go from that approach to solve our problem? And keeping in mind that we want to make it you know, philosophically Kubernetes technology, Kubernetes-like, but from the end user perspective, virtualization-like, again, to breach the gap and make it easier to converge. Different use cases for virtualization. Uh, we're just to be clear, again, we want to focus not on the, I want to better isolate containers. We, we're looking at the full-fledged VMs, uh, still early. You know, potential, very promising on what can we do, but you know, doing the POC, it's, it's very cool. You know, running VMs in pods, live migration, which is one of the you know, some more advanced features of virtualization. Really nice, fits very well. That's the easy part, doing you know, enterprise virtualization, doing robust application, 80% of what you spend your time in is on the error flows. That's going to be you know, the hard gap to do this. It looks so far like a win-win. You know, things that we want to do in Kubernetes are on the Kubernetes roadmap. Things in Kubernetes lend themselves really nicely to advanced feature in virtualization. So, so far, it looks really nice. And you know, if Hopefully there's enough interest across different groups. So for something like a special interest group, a SIGVIRT or something like that in the Kubernetes space. And obviously would love if you can, if you'd like to join us on the Kubernetes, you know, GitHub, try the demos, look at the code uh, and join the discussions on what we're doing. Questions? Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> So the question was, how do we would like to handle storage volumes? Virtual machines expect block storage. So one of the things we're looking at is uh, not having the kubelet mount the, block, the, the storage, rather pass it through to the pod, for example. So uh, we can do the connection directly from uh, the QMU process. If you think about libgf API or librbd for cluster SF or iSCSI, user space SCSI can be done from the QMU process themselves. Similar for block storage, would like maybe uh, some of the mount to happen at the block storage, but not the entire handling to happen at Kubelet. So pass through some of the logic as URIs, as paths, and have uh, them handled by the pod inside. Yeah. Just a small addition. Itima is right, obviously, but <laughs> we've got a short term and long term. So one, you can delegate it to QMU. If you've got if you've got storage supported by QMU, like iSCSI or RBD, we pass it through. But the other idea is to work with Kubernetes to allow the delegation of the volume mounting and handling to the container. So that, for example, you associate the volume to the pod, but you leave it to the pod itself to do the mounting. What, what benefit do we have? We can, for example, if we get fiber channel connection or a fiber channel block device connected by the kubelet, that device would pass through to the pod and then Kuma could consume it directly without mounting it. So we're looking for, for both approach. Yeah. Yes, I wonder if you could expand the networking part because I find it's a big difference, right, between the networking 
right now in Kubernetes is expected to be starting just having an individual interface but you get to the VMs that working can be really different so what was that what is your plan? Yeah, so the question was, what about networking? So first, networking turned out to be a bit more complicated than we expected, but that's not an issue. I just spoke to the Clear Container guys, and they've got some nice ideas. Um, so first, we've got the multi-network proposal, which is going much into the direction of, of what we need. So we will be able to attach multiple networks to pods, and that maps nicely to, to VMs, because we could say you could at least have one NIC per network. If we make the assumption that you say every network is a NIC, and then we could play nice with the Kubernetes concepts again. Um, but, and that is what we also need, that is why I would like to see a ZigVert, is that, for example, la la layer 2 connectivity for VMs would be important. Because sometimes you, as a pet VM, you want to have the control over the IP addresses you, you give to your VMs. So, multi-networks is one topic, layer 2 connectivity is another topic, and then how the whole implementation looks is another topic of, so how to cooperate with CNI, to, to connect v, uh, tabs, for example. Okay. More questions? Yeah. yeah. So, uh, I'd like uh, you to explain a little bit uh, more about uh, why you not know, to choose the CRI approach. I remember uh, there are points uh, about uh, the possibility to run just uh, one runtime on the node, but actually, uh, I think I get to you offline because I think we need to clear the stage for yet another person. Thank you. Whoever remains.